just to chime in with what Gillian said about don't wait till your data is perfect, hmm. I just wonder what your plan is for sharing that data. Are you going to be sharing the data that you're gathering and that you're generating as you go along rather than waiting till the end of each grant? Because, you know, I'm, I'm sure there will be other researchers who'd love to to combine their data with some of the data that's that's being generated here? I'm very happy to tell you that we have been sharing the data. Excellent. The data are available as a part of our data service. And um, we uh, have been putting out calls for expressions of interest in which we list our sort of our data catalog. Um, I think the best way might be to uh, send us an email so we can put you in our mailing list. Um, perhaps there are other ways or as well by means of which we can ensure that this community gets news of uh, the kinds of data we have and can apply on time so that they can access our data. But it's very much available, some of the data I was talking about. Phil Kaiser from uh, NHS National Services Scotland. Uh, we didn't really talk much in, in any of the, the, the speakers' talks around the public and the public trust, and there's, a, there's a, a view, that particularly when it comes to public services, that there's a, a trust deficit around the use of data. Uh, and, and obviously being able to routinely share personal data is going to be critical to improving public services. Uh, and we heard Roger talking about the example of the local authorities, which is something that, that my organisation is involved with around trying to get linked health and social care data. And, and that reticence to share is, is a reflection probably of organisations' interpretation of that trust deficit. I just wonder if any of the, the panel members has a view on how we address the trust deficit around the sharing of personal data for public benefit. Um, this issue of trust is really important because I don't think it's as straightforward as simply trust. Um, so there is research that would suggest that most people trust their NHS to look after their data, their medical records, because they understand that public bodies, public servants, do appreciate and understand that sensitive data particularly is personal. That's blown out the water when the front page of the Herald talks about somebody just being fined £250,000 for leaving medical records in a skip in a car park. Um, but if we... I think look wider than only personal data and look at how the public generally value information. Uh, we do an annual poll about access to information. Rights to information awareness is really high in Scotland. 85% of people know they have a right to ask. Um, but when we say does it give you more confidence in decisions? Actually, well over 70% of the public in Scotland say access to information gives you more confidence. Now, if you stop in, in the decisions of public bodies, so if we think about building trust, not just in relation to personal data, but into responsible and good use of data generally, and then overlay the personal, we understand the, dif the different risks on top of that, I think we'd go a lot further. Um, and I'd also say that um, key to all of this is communication, because I, I think how something is communicated in terms of what's going to be done with it, we saw that example with the, the care data. Mm. Um, had it been communicated differently, I don't think we'd have been where we were. So uh, what I would say to data owners is don't forget all those good things you've learned about good customer relations and how you build general trust and then apply it just a little bit better to data. Mm. I don't know. Just a couple of things to, to add to that, if I may. I think there's, there's three things, and I, th I completely agree with all that Rosemary said there. Um, the, the, for me, there's something about building the expertise in knowledge <coughs> of of, of handling data, um, and that's both from sort of the, the, um, of, of the legal issues, uh, but also uh, in ensuring that there's there are trusted systems that people can stick to for um, for handling that data securely, considering the ethics, 
um, uh, of, of, hand, uh, of, of managing that data. Um, so that, and we've got the principles of having safe people, safe research, and safe data and, um, to do that. But I think there's also something else, which is, as I mentioned earlier, it's about ensuring that people know what data is about them uh, have have about them under you know this this is the underpinning this is transparency for people uh, and and transparency is a way to to engender that trust so I think there's there's something about um, um, ensuring people know what data they've got but also um, uh, engaging with, with the public at a scale that we haven't done so far in what the benefits of um, sharing data and the risks of not doing so um, and the, you know while, while we know that the vast majority of people expect us to be sharing data already and are slightly surprised when, when they realize that we don't there are a, a significant uh, you know not, not insignificant mi minority that, uh, that don't feel that way and I feel that uh, sort of take, taking uh, Taking that head on and sort of explaining to people, so that it's not the um, it's not the media headlines that Rosemary uh, mentioned there that, that get prominence. It's about um, sort of some of the, the great things that we, we talked about here, and some of the, the um, avoiding some of the, the bad things as well um, in data sharing. So public engagement certainly. There's a real issue about health data as to who feels most threatened by the issue of access to health data. Uh, I think there's one debate about, if you like, patients, and there's a different debate about doctors and, and, and medical staff, and I think a lot of the, the issues about access to medical data are actually more about the rights of the professionals than they're actually about the rights of the individuals. So I think we need to be careful about you know, who's protecting what and on what basis, because, because these things get confused. Uh, and that's, that's something that really needs to, be, needs to be looked at. I think the other thing is actually we need a proper honest debate about privacy issues, you know, where government is actually honest about what it wants and what the benefits of, of sharing data are, and the, the privacy lobby is a bit more honest about what, it, what it's trying to achieve. We've got a very false debate going on at the minute, mm -hmm. you know, where everybody's kind of shouting at different ends. And we're not actually making the kind of progress we need to because I don't think there's a sufficiently realistic debate. Um, there are great benefits to be got, got from, uh, for example, if you take the management of, management of care, from having social work data being shared with health data, being shared with, with other kinds of things, with the proper safeguards for the individuals. Mm -hmm. The reason that's not happening is not because individuals are objecting, it's because the professionals in each of these silos are not sharing or feel threatened by the process of, of sharing. So we need to work out where the real barriers are as opposed to the theoretical barriers. And then I think there's, there's also the sense in which government needs to say why it wants to do these kinds of things more explicitly and in a more reasoned way than perhaps it's, it, it, it tends to shy away from it because it's difficult, but I think if we can get out there and, and make a, a realistic e explanation and, and, and make sure that the appropriate safeguards are put in place rather than you know, sort of theoretical safeguards, we'll actually get much, much further. And I think in, in Scotland in particular, we've got such data potential because of the way in which records have actually been constructed in the past. It's a real source of potential competitive advantage for Scotland if we get this right. Uh, yeah. and I think it's, a, it's something that if we can take forward a proper debate on it, it, it would be to the advantage of everybody. I just need to add something that's food for thought for you. Freedom of information, environmental information, it's domestic Scottish law. We have complete control over it. Data protection, it's UK law. Scotland does not have complete control over it. We don't even have a seat at the table when it comes to European debates in relation to GDPR and things like that. Now, I'm going to no further than say you might want to give that food for thought in terms of if, if your aim is policy, if your aim is public sector improvement, if your aim is the citizen of Scotland, are we at a disadvantage in Scotland because we're one removed from the lawmakers uh, in terms of things that um, impact on how we use data? I have a couple of comments as well. Um, 
I think trust is a difficult one. I think it's difficult because, first of all, it's very difficult to define. And secondly, it's not something I don't think we can address overnight or immediately. Trust requires having a system of laws, technological solutions to make sure that your bank account doesn't get hacked and so on and so forth. It's not only about privacy, it's really about information security as well. But I think I'm most passionate about um, things relating to uh, consumer awareness, digital literacy, the idea that definitions of digital literacy has to change because everything is digital. You're producing, you're always constantly in, an, in a data environment now. Where, can you, where are you not producing data if you're in a city like this or wherever? So um, creating the pipeline of rights and responsibilities and understanding uh, sort of the real world implications of people's behavior, I think all that is needed as well in order to sort of start a culture of thinking about trust in a more open way. Um, so it's uh, more than just laws and regulations. All the stuff I was saying earlier about the big challenge of um, value chains, that's the easy bit compared with um, the sort of cultural, legal, technological, societal upheaval, we need to actually come to sensible conclusions about that question. And I think what Des was saying about what we need is an open debate, we'll at least start that. But the steps we need to take to the point where an individual can understand what their data is being used for and have some input to and control over that and balancing individual preferences and needs versus communal needs of you know, maybe sharing your medical data versus um, having a, a, a big collection of data to do um, research on, that kind of question. And letting people, educating people on what is being done and what <coughs> they should be done and obviously completely upturning our legal system to support it. Um, yeah, difficult to know where to start, but at least having a, an open debate about it, I think, is what we need. Um, this is a, an area about citizenship as well. Most of the data um, around, most of the administrative data um, is given freely by citizens in order to access a government service. And I think most people who provide information freely to internet services realize that they're doing that in order to get a better service out of that, out of that company. They don't want Amazon to sell your data, or they don't want Amazon to sell data to big pharmaceutical companies. They certainly don't want their health data sold to big pharma. But giving data to government ought to be part of a, or giving data to government and allowing government to reuse it under very clear um, codes of practice and also under very clear legal constraints ought to be part of the pact of, of being a citizen and operating within society. And this is much too broad an area for, I mean, I think it's much too broad an area to, to think about now. But it is an important area where educators, we've heard the word education, I think, spoken by everybody, um, educate, educators are not picking up this challenge as part of helping people understand, especially younger people, understand where their rights are within a digital economy, and a digital economy that is slightly more confused by the role of government or, or the role of their data within government. I'm looking for, for some more questions, please. Yeah, there is one here. Um, Matthew, I think that was a great introduction to my question, my next question, actually, talking about education. I'm Dr. Eleni Karajanidou from Strathclyde University, uh, Department of Education specifically, and thank you so much for that um, introduction. You're bringing in mind a lot of work that um, is done by educators in Scotland at the moment. Uh, for example, Youth Scotland involving young children um, and older children, young people, um, discussing, educating themselves and educating as adults about their rights and their obligations when it comes to the internet. 
So I'm hearing a lot of questions here about privacy and trust and ethics and the legal framework <coughs> around it. Um, Vaughan referred to biases. Um, we're talking about reliability and validity of data. And I think it's quite telling that these questions are amongst the first questions to come up fr from the floor. So my question is really linked to, to what you were saying about reusing the data. Only I will reward that, if you don't mind. The way I like to think about it is not reusing data, but repurposing data, using data for a different purpose. And I think that's quite important for me. It means asking different questions about the same data and for different purposes. And what I'd like to hear for, from our panel today is your take on this. Perhaps what do you think is important to consider? What frameworks, ethical, legal, etc., are important when it comes to repurposing data? One example of this, and it's a huge, it's a huge question, it has many aspects, but as an example, say, for example, that I'm a, I represent a tobacco company and I'm using, um, I want access to da data that, has, that have been um, gathered um, by researchers at a university to explore adolescents' experiences with smoking and their habits. As a tobacco company, in getting access to public data like that, I might want to repurpose it. So what I, want, what I would like to hear today is a little bit about you know, the frameworks that you think are important when it comes to not just reusing, but repurposing, what I call repurposing data. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you very much. Um, you're going to yeah, try and I, kick this one off? Well, I'm only going to say, say one thing, but uh, which is uh, a, a piece of work a couple of years ago was looking at trust in data and sort of asking the, the, the public, what are the factors that affected their uh, whether they were comfortable or not for their data to be used in different things. And quite an underlying uh, theme that came from that, um, from, um, from some groups across Scotland, was this, um, the concept of data can be used for improving the public good. And that that is sort of a, pretty much a, a driving force behind uh, the, the way uh, the, the the arrangements that we've got for sharing, linking, and reusing data, in that we've got now got a, a public benefit and, and privacy panel that is set up to, um, to to take judgments about specifically what is the public benefit of the particular pro proposition to to share and link data. Uh, we've and so I you know I think for me that is at the heart of it. So. In, in the particular situation that, that you described with um, a, a tobacco company, you know, the, the, I would say that the case for public benefit in that situation would be harder for them to um, ha harder for them to make than it would be in in, in many other cases. But uh, so I, I think for me that's the, that's the heart of it uh, is is having that as a principle. Does someone else want to have a knock at this ethical? Question. Go ahead. Um, just a quick one. I mean, I understand that the kind of examples you're thinking of are, are ones probably with um, significant personal data, um, and and those are clearly tricky ones from a privacy point of view. But just to say in more general terms, I think repurposing of data kind of assumes that there was only one purpose to start with, and a lot of our most useful data collections were collected with a more general idea in mind. So, say things like the um, the census. You is it's designed to meet. Um, a huge number of different purposes. And a lot of the time, if we're looking at maximizing impact, then the more repurposing and reuse we can support, the better, because there's a huge number of questions out there that might be helped by your bit of data, but you hadn't realized it when you collected it. Obviously, we need to deal with kind of uh, um, disclosure controls and, and personal data and, and all that kind of stuff. But the, in cases where those risks are acceptable, then I think there's a kind of, sort of process and technology stuff around you documenting your data and how you collected it well enough that someone else can reuse it in a different context 
reliably or know where, whether it makes sense or not to do that. So, yeah, the more repurposing, the better within privacy limits, I would say. How many people in the room are familiar with reuse regulations 2015? Sorry, I sound like a lawyer, I'm not. <laughs> Did you know they exist? Um, most public bodies in Scotland are subject to reuse regulations 2015. And in a nutshell, what that says is anything that's not personal data, that's anonymous and that is accessible i.e. it's published, it's already made available, you can get it through FOI. There is an automatic right to reuse it for a different purpose for which it was created. So I would say the first challenge for public bodies in Scotland, if we want to leverage value out of our data, is to try and make as much of it anonymised as we possibly can. And if you're going to do that, it ties in with something Roger said earlier about design that in from your collection and the way you hold it and um, manage it to start with. There's a different debate about reusing personal data. And I think that's in a, a more ethical sense and within a legal framework um, as well. And that is about this is about ownership and consent and control because I'd say the thing that underpins lack of trust is lack of perception of control of our own data. So we, I think, would have an opportunity with the new general data protection regulation when it comes to things like consent, owning your own data. The number of times that you get asked something, um, are we a tick here if I can contact you about Christmas cards, about this, about this, about this? Um, even a starting point for consent is, would you be willing for, your per for us, someone to contact you about personal data to be used for health research, this research, this research? And I think some of it is being smart about giving confidence that we are taking personal data and an individual's right to control it seriously and we put in place things to deal with it. But in terms of some research, the more we can make available without personal data in it, even better. Yeah. No, I think that's I think that's a really important <coughs> distinction. I mean I I've been doing some work on the ethics of the or ethics in the reuse of um, reuse or repurposing of new and novel forms of data or big data. And one of the things which I think we tend to forget is this distinction between the protection of people's rights, which is a legal matter, and the respect that we should also have for people, which is, which is the ethical side of it. And the respect tends to get forgotten when we're dealing with things that are supposed to be absolute, black and white, um, in terms of the legal side. I think if a big, or if a tobacco company, um, full disclosure, I smoke, um, but a tobacco company, if they can make a case that using these data is in the public benefit, um, then yes, they should be allowed to use it. There should not be an ethical reason for them not to use it. But if they use it for, for that purpose of public benefit only, then that's acceptable. But if they use it for a purpose which is clearly not in the public benefit, then perhaps they shouldn't, or not even perhaps they shouldn't. But that's why the, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten what it's called, the Public Benefit and Privacy Panel, um, the National Statistician in England and Wales has um, an ethics review group. Um, the, the idea of the approved researcher under the Statistics and Registration Act um, allows for public benefit for a research proposal to be assessed before people can have access to um, consented for research personal data. Um, but it's a, it is a tricky question and there are no black and white there are no black and white answers. Your definition of public good or public benefit may end up being different from mine. So it ends up being decisions by committee um, who are trying to do the right thing 
in respecting what they believe the, the individual um, would have consented to or needs to consent to. I've got one more, we've got time for one more question. I'd love to, I'd love to hear somebody um, ask about data quality. Von Uz mentioned bias and um, in, in data and we, I'll ask, I'll ask the panel if, if you can make some remarks about the, the integration of what I'll say is now pretty standard statistical evaluation of the, of the quality of the data and how do we deal in terms of big data, it's not a direct question, but it's how do we deal with data that's missing. Um, there is so much missing, there is so much that um, is imperfect um, within some of the larger, newer novel forms of data that we're dealing with. Is there ever going to be a, a sort of a standard statistical type approach to dealing with this, or is this going to be left in the hands of the young, the young data scientists who, who are all going to be miraculously trained somehow? Um, um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, but I'll start with uh, just some uh, humour or, or lighting, like la enlightenment. Um, if any of you don't or haven't done, ha have a listen to Tim Harford's Radio 4 programme, more or less, mm. where he, um, he would say, blows holes in lots of statistics and reports and back to the tobacco company. Uh, frankly, if the tobacco company tell anyone in the room that smoking is good for you, then I'm not sure we would believe that particular conclusion. Uh, I, I, but watch that. And there's there's a f fascinating organisation in the US just now um, fact-checking on the politicians' statements in the presidential election. And you can actually send in quotes from Trump or Clinton. And they will rate them in terms of from absolute truth to liar, liar, pants on fire. Uh, and it's really quite entertaining. Um, and they've, they've published information. In fact, neither of them get above the halfway line from the liar, liar, pants on fire um, level. So <laughs> I, th I think uh, data quality is an issue. There is absolute holes in data. And, and it's back to that point I make. You, the, your data will never be perfect. Start where you are. What is, is very encouraging and... and some of the work that we are doing with academics is that there is more and more research and understanding and new models and new techniques that handle missing data, incorrect data, uh, to, to, I guess, those new techniques, those new capabilities, those, those new types of deep, deep learning networks, etc., cognitive, AI, all of those things are actually helping in, in the area where the data isn't perfect. But, but those new capabilities, that, that new research is being applied in ways that, that you can still defer insight and, and hopefully drive impact from, from data that is imperfect. Superb, thank you. Vonu, have you yeah, add um, to this? With big data, um, there is all, you know, there's this new mantra of doing analysis, which is uh, data-driven mm. modeling. And of course, the so-called old world was that it was research-driven modeling. I don't know what the differences really are. I think they're <laughs> all very fuzzy. Um, and, and, and the idea that, uh, and you know, people get really upset about this, right? I mean, data-driven modeling and research-driven modeling. Um, but I think, this, I, I think if you look at if you start from a set of, if you start from a point of view that you want to address some complex problem and you need different types of data to answer that problem. Not, like you said, no data are perfect. I've spent year, uh, years, in some cases, fixing problems of case deletion in gold standard social science survey where with the people who didn't respond because they're not representative and blah, blah, blah. You know, you can't do anything very much with it and so on and so forth. We know this. This stuff has existed forever. So I think that really, in a sense, 
We started from that world in the social sciences, and then we went through a very data-driven world where we pulled together all these very imperfect sources of data, supposedly. And then now we are, I think, going back full circle in a sense that we are going back to answering the questions starting from a phenomena and then thinking about how do you bring all these forms of data, perfect or imperfect, and tell, stitch it all together to tell you a story. I think that's going to be important, not individual forms of data, because individual forms of data are always going to be problematic. Yeah. When I hear people talk about this, and I do a lot, when I hear about the distinction between research-driven and data-driven, the research-driven model always results in, in research, whereas the data-driven model tends to um, end up with producing insight. And it may, that may simply be a, a semantic difference, um, but it does tend towards two cultures, one which is more academic and one which is more business. Um, and the insight world has spread from business into the third sector, into government, much more than it spread into academia. Academia seems to still prefer research. Uh, but you need both, yes. And they are, in fact, the same thing. I mean, insight is a product of research. Um, and research delivers an insight. 